country. For example, they took a new management team to dramatically turn Commonwealth Edison around last year. And this year, California and several southern states continue to face energy and power problems of various sorts. The California problems have been and continue to be national news. Turnarounds are not easy, but people's gas, or now it's renamed people's energy, has generally managed to steer clear of these high profile challenges. Now, this sign was written before I saw our friends outside. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing your friends along. <laughs> uh, the credit for this has to go to our guest today. He is a graduate of St. Norbert's College and University of Wisconsin Law School. He joined People's Gas in 1972 and was elected Vice President and General Counsel in 1981. Three years later, he was elected Executive Vice President for Strategic and Financial Services. In 1987, he was elected President and Chief Operating Officer and assumed his current position as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer in December 1990. He served on the Board of Directors of DePaul University, Xavier University, St. Norbert's College, the Executive Advisors of the Metropolitan Planning Council and the Board of Governors of Economic America. He is also on the board of Amstead Industries, Bankmark Financial Corp, and its subsidiary Harris Bank Corp and Harris Trust and Bank. Harris Trust and Savings Bank. Our guest and his wife Catherine have a son and a daughter and live in Willowbrook. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the City Club of Chicago the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Chicago-based People's Energy Corporation, Dick Perry. Dick. Here in Chicago, through our own Share the Warmth program, we have helped more than 1,000 households with $300 grants towards their heating bills. We committed a total of a half a million dollars to this program and with a $250,000 donation from the City of Chicago and contributions from our customers, we expect to distribute more than $900,000 this winter through the Share the Warm. In addition, we have a budget program that enables our customers to spread their payments evenly over 12 months. Currently, Nearly one-third of all residential heating customers are enrolled in one of our options. In February, through our Customer First events, we visited six separate communities to provide conservation information, enrollment and financial assistance programs, and payment plans. This year, we have already participated in more than 30 community outreach activities throughout Chicago. Our work will not stop here. We stopped, <coughs> we stopped residential heating disconnections in November. We will extend this policy through the end of April for those customers who are making a good faith effort to pay. Now I would like to clarify some fundamental facts about our business. People's gas has two functions, gas distribution and gas purchasing. The gas distribution part of our business includes delivering gas through our system and related activities like billing and metering. This is where the company makes its profit. We have not sought a rate increase in the distribution charge from the Illinois Commerce Commission in nearly six years, and we intend to hold to our firm rate. The other part of our business is gas purchasing. We buy gas and sell it to the customers without any markup for profit. People's Gas is well connected to six major interstate pipelines. This helps us assure reliability and access to a broad range of natural gas supplies. Because we do not earn a profit on a gas price, some say this gives us no incentive to keep prices reasonable. 
we disagree. High prices affect us also. There are major problems from a customer satisfaction standpoint. We have to borrow more money to finance our gas purchases. Bad debt goes up. We lose customers who turn to alternate fuels. And com consumption goes down due to conservation, so our delivery revenues decline. We encourage conservation, but it does affect our profits. People's gas problems that I outlined are part of a national issue. President Bush recognizes the importance of this issue. In his address to the nation Tuesday, he referred to rising energy prices at the beginning of his speech. He has also set up a policy group headed by Vice President Cheney to recommend, make recommendations for a national energy policy. Turning to the state level, the Illinois Commerce Commission has issued a notice of inquiry looking into this winter's high prices. This notice of inquiry will serve as a good vehicle for dialogue concerning the right approach to purchasing practices. In the long term, buying at market prices provides the lowest price. However, it does not pro provide price stability. Tools such as hedging can be used to dampen volatility, but they do come at a cost. And at least the three years prior to this winter, hedging would have resulted in prices higher than market-based prices. One of the issues raised by hedging is regulatory risk. Under current practice, gains would benefit the ratepayer, but losses could be charged to shareholders, which potentially could threaten the financial viability of the company. In order for hedging to be effective, further guidelines would also have to be developed to provide a safe harbor for hedging a portion of a utility's portfolio. Gas utilities need support for choosing price stability over market-based fluctuations. Another layer of issues facing us concerns residential choice of suppliers. Opening the residential market to choice would allow customers to purchase their gas from suppliers other than the utility. In the mid-80s, we opened our system to allow large volume users to select their natural gas supplier. This spring, People's Gas intends to file a plan with the Commission to phase in an expansion of our current Choices for You program to extend into the residential market. We're also watching the NICOR filing to expand Choice in its service territory. This case is currently being heard at the Commission with an order expected this summer. A principal concern in any market opening of this kind is the development of adequate consumer protection for residential customers who will now have to select their suppliers in an unfamiliar marketplace. <coughs> Illinois electric restructuring legislation gave the cons Commission considerable jurisdiction over alternate electric suppliers. However, this legislation does not extend to alternate gas suppliers. Another issue that needs to be looked at is the role of the provider of last resort. If it is to be the utilities, there will be a need for some provision for the recovery of costs and other operational protections. I would now like to look at the future of gas prices and comment on the outlook for the remainder of this year. The Department of Energy and Cambridge Energy Resources, a distinguished private consultant, Forecast summer prices ranging anywhere between $4.25 and $5.50. Their winter forecast puts prices in the $5.40 to $5.50 range. Today, the futures market is in the range of $5.20 to $5.50, with very little difference between winter and summer. However, the futures market is not a very reliable forecaster. It did not predict the tripling of prices this winter. Certainly there is a question of how much gas will be stored in producing areas under a $5 price scenario this summer. In conclusion, I want to say that the most important step we can take to address pricing issues is to continue to work at the federal level to support policies to bring supply and demand back into balance. We will also continue working with state and local officials on ways to mitigate the impact of another winter of potentially record high gas costs and we will continue to help our customers manage their bills. Clearly, there are many issues confronting the uh, natural gas market that must be addressed, both nationally and locally. 
With a 150-year presence in this market, People's Energy will continue to play a leading role in preserving the viability and reliability of natural gas delivery in Illinois. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and now we'll open up for questions. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll now have the questions, comments. If you have them, please walk over to the microphone. There's one of our members over there, Mr. Berkowitz, going over the microphone. He's walking slowly. He's getting up. Yes. Yeah. Don't no, rush things here. Keep working. Uh, yeah. uh, can we hear the microphone, folks? Fine. Yeah. Can you hear it? Try it. Doesn't seem to be working. Yet. I'm cautious about getting up here. Yeah. Where's our technician? Anyway, shout. Right there. there you are. Okay. You spoke about, the, I think, the regulatory risk or, or the, the issue that when you had the benefit comes to the to the customer or consumer, but if it goes well, if it doesn't, the cost is imposed on the shareholder. So I wondered if the protesters, if that's an ICC problem, should the protesters have been at the doors of the ICC no. rather than here, or is it a legislative issue? So where should you be lobbying? What should you be doing to change that so you could head more reasonably? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to go back and make sure people understand what I said. What hedging does is not guarantee you a low price. You don't get hedge, the hedge price or the lowest market price, whichever is lower. It doesn't work that way. Hedging is designed to give stability. It doesn't guarantee a low price. Um, what I would say with respect to your question is, you, it, I don't want to accuse you of this, but it sounds like you're trying to point the villain, and there is no villain in the picture. Um, I think that as far as what we should do here is I think the NOI has served an excellent vehicle for further discussing this issue. As I mentioned in my speech, it'd be good if we could develop some safe harbor rules so we could have that type of uh, of protection when we go in and, th and that at this point we're going to be putting in comments other people will be putting in comments and I think that as I said uh, we'll have an excellent opportunity for dialogue on this I don't think that uh, when you talk about the protesters that uh, you know that's an issue here that when you talk about protesters it seems like you're looking for a villain and I don't see a villain in this piece okay a follow-up follow yes without looking for a villain what 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 is the way to change that? I understand you say you can't guarantee more stable prices, but most people would think in this day and age, a company such as yours would be more to hedge the uncertainty. Right. And 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 some people have said you tried to do that a few years ago. The ICC was not receptive in terms of evening out the distribution of gains and losses that we just talked about. So without pointing the ICC as a villain. Was that an issue then, and what's the best way okay. to change that? Well, it, that's true. We did go in a couple of years ago for a hedging program. Uh, we were looking for 31 cents. The commission order came out at 25. There were a couple of issues in that case, uh, disagreement, and I'll say is somewhat technical rules of evidence, what evidence could be used to support a price. We had five years, and under the statute, you have a one-year period, uh, so that was a problem. There were also dispute as to what cost could be recovered. And so, as a result, uh, we didn't get the, the price that we were looking for. Interestingly enough, if we had gotten that price, we would have been at or above the market for about a year before the market started to turn around. So there is, if you look back at that, there is evidence that, you know, hedging does not guarantee you the lowest price. Sure, now we all sit here as benefit of hindsight, and it would be nice to have it in place. But, but what I suggested earlier in my speech in response to your question is it would be well if we could if that's the desire of, of people to get more stability, recognize you may pay a higher price, uh, then some type of um, safe harbor rules would be well. well what, what, what am I thinking of? If you had gotten that higher price and that had knowledge that rippled through the market, that might have had an effect on long term supply, ultimately it would have had a dampening effect on prices, at least some of those. Well, Knowing that you're going to be able to buy at a higher price in the future might allow yeah. producers to go out. And yeah, well, this, now you're touching on another point. That this is something else you have to be careful of because if you do have a program, you can't have a public record spread out over 10 months saying what your strategy is going to be but it's because 
it doesn't help you when you go out in the marketplace. It would be nice to have some process that could be very, done very quickly on a basis where we didn't have to publicize everything. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, further questions, comments? Yes, sir. Oh, I know you. <laughs> Quinn is the name. I'm one of the protesters. Uh, I also happen to be a customer of, nitro of people's gas. And, uh, no speech, Pat. Street. No speech, Pat, just a question. Pat, you hear me? No speech, just a question. Here's a question. Mr. Terry, the rate payers pay you a salary of $1,395,025 last year. In this morning's paper, the headline is, Utility Can't Overestimate the Trouble Its Errors Can Cause. There are all kinds of problems with estimated bills, with error-prone meter readings, with uh, prices that have gone beyond limit. Uh, people in Michigan are paying 29 cents a therm. Here's a bill. Here in Chicago, we're paying 90 cents a therm. Crane Chicago Business said that your company is not managing risk. It's putting its customer base at risk. What I'm here to ask you on behalf of the customers is, why do you deserve that big salary when you've made all these mistakes and your company has fumbled and bumbled and caused tremendous hardship for literally thousands upon thousands of Chicago consumers? Okay, Pat, you had a number of observations there. I'm taking one by one. First of all, on the salary, I'm not up here to defend my salary, uh, but you made a mistake. You said the rate payers are paying 1.4 million. That's not true. Remember I said we didn't have a rate case since 1985? That case had less than half of that in there. So most, there's half of that at least is being picked up by shareholders. It is basically our board of directors sets that with outside consultants. I don't have anything to do with it. Now, with respect to the next issue you raised in estimated bills, there is a problem in estimated bills. That's right. And that's why we put in a system starting four years ago that by the end of this year, we will eliminate mes estimated bills. We will do all that by remote meter reading. One of the problems in the city of Chicago is that it's difficult to get in buildings. And so as a result, we have to do estimates. And this year, that problem is compounded somewhat because of the fact that we do have the high prices. Now, in Michigan, you cited Michigan as an example. In Michigan, those companies did go in to the commission and they did get approval for the fixed rate, and they are having problems with it. Uh, the trade press has said consumers is losing a fair amount of money, and I know MCN is now in to change that program. Now, what was your last point? Well, I, had, I had a call from a lady just yesterday who got a $2,600 bill. Oh, no, your last point related to cranes. Right, cranes is right. all the business. Right, we disagreed with cranes. I mean, cr let me point out what you're talking about here. Let's just give you an example. Let's go back to our case that I talked about. Uh, we were at 31 cents. The commission order was uh, 25 and a fraction, let's say 26 cents. Five cents of difference. Okay, let's say we went ahead anyway and hedged, okay, without commission approval. Now we got a commission order that said you should have used 25 plus, and it's 31 cents. Let's say the price never went up, and we had all, you know, interveners opposing us. The price didn't go up. I got five cents a therm times my volume. Let's say I hit the whole thing. It's 140 BCF. I right now have the total five cents times 140 BCF is $70 million. That's basically the risk, the total profit of the company. Put it in perspective. Our gas cost this year are going to be somewhere in the range of $900 million. Our profits are less than 10% of that. So there's only so much you can play with. And I disagree with you that our company is not well run. I think we've done a good job. We have held our costs down. We have not gone in for rates since 1985 in a market in the city of Chicago that's not growing. So if you, I disagree with you on that. You're losing your customers right now by the bungling of your company that's caused so much hardship for so many people. You haven't answered the question about, about why you as a former president of the American Gas Association didn't anticipate the problem and, pr and manage the risk in a way that didn't put the entire I think I did answer that question about three times, Pat. Well, you have to answer your customers sooner or later. Okay. Okay, Patrick Quinn, give him a hand anyway, because he's a nice guy. He's the former state treasurer of the state of Illinois and uh, frequently on my radio show. <laughs> 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 Next question. Yes, sir. 
Yes, I'm Patrick Giordano with the energy law firm Giordano and Associates. I'm sure at one time Dick would rather see me than the prior speaker. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> there may be some conflict here, but not quite that much. In fact, I actually think that uh, I'm encouraged by your proposal, uh, not yet a proposal, but to allow choice for all customers in your system because. I believe that the competition has had a, an excellent effect in, in all markets in driving, in driving prices down. And, but what I'm concerned about is that obviously there's problems now with the NICOR customer select program being opposed by the Citizens Utility Board. So the devil's in the details and how, what do you, are you really planning to propose if you know and how do you plan to avoid those sorts of problems so that we can actually get <laughs> some programs in place that can allow choice for all customers in the service yeah. district? Okay. Well, first of all, so everybody understands for our larger markets, our larger customers, we opened up our system in the mid-80s, so that is clearly open. What we're talking about now is smaller commercial customers. We have the Choices for You program that is currently in place. We have a filing in place now to make that permanent. <coughs> Our intention is to take that same type of program and apply it to residential customers as well. There are issues, as I mentioned in my speech, and how, how we handle this. Uh, we're watching the NICOR filing to see what commission policy may be there, but we will have our filing on file this spring. We're still working on it, so I'm not really in a position, Pat, to give you the, the details of it at this point. All right, but you're, you're, are, are, you, are you going to be working with, uh, possibly working with interested groups to, to get agreement prior to the filing? Well, I would think so. Certainly we would be touching base with, uh, you know, we know who the interested groups are, and to the extent we can iron things out in advance, we certainly would want to do that. 